I come here as a teacher, and at the end of the day, after 20 years in service, I think I stand with my colleagues with this same message, and it's something that's very personal to me, and I think human beings are, are mysteries. All of us are mysteries, and deep down, we are all unconsciously looking for them. When we have them, the hurts are lessened. When we don't have them, the hurts can go deeper over the years. There are the treaties in life that are perhaps are precious to all of us, precious to me, but we don't have time to talk about it often. The three Ds, debt, dignity, and devotion. As a teacher, I've been privileged to be a humble recipient of these experiences, and many times humbled by them because they've been brought to me and given to me by my students. And there are three short stories I'd like to share with you from my teaching career that helped, that really rooted me uh, as a human being over the years. First is one of my students whom I taught in secondary school. Uh, there was one time where I recommended a movie to the class and uh, I mentioned it casually and she actually went home to watch it. Uh, a week later, she came to me looking a little unusual and she approached me and she said, Sir, can I have a word with you? She was in upper sec. I said, sure, I do. Because sometimes for teachers like us, our greatest powers are our powers of observation. And then I brought her somewhere in the open canteen side of the school and then she took a while for her to open up. I said, is, is everything okay? And she said, I remember the movie that you recommended us? I said, yes. She said, uh, it spoke to me. I said, okay. And then the tears started to fall. And then through intermittent uh, speech patterns and little thoughts and little statements in between, she revealed that she has been uh, sexually abused for many years by her own family member. Um, at that point in time, I was feeling awkward, I was feeling shocked, and I had to stop her and I said, do you want to carry on? Because she, she is... She is a female, I'm a male teacher, and I said, and I need to, I, my thinking was, this is not appropriate, this conversation cannot go on. And, and the first thing I did was, can, can I refer you to your form teacher? Because I know the form teacher happens to be a lady. And she said no, and I let her continue her story. And it was, I was just stunned, because I've never encountered such a case before. Um, when I then, you know, the teacher and me would press all the safety buttons and I said, can I refer you to the police? Can I go see the principal now? And she said, no, no, and no. So after listening to her story, I, something just told me to ask her this question. Can you promise me you would at least tell your parents? She paused for a while. And this family member is someone who comes from overseas and stays with them. And he has been abusing her since she was a child. And mind you, she's only 16. And she said, I will. Okay, so over the next two weeks, all the way to two months, I journeyed with her. Uh, and eventually, I managed to persuade her to see the school counsellor, who happens to be a lady, because I think that would be the more appropriate space for her to receive um, directed support as well. And the good thing that came out of it was that um, she was, she found the courage to tell the parents. The parents did something and didn't allow the abuser to come to the home ever again. She was like someone stuck in a forest. The forest was something familiar, it's like a home. She thought she would be safe there. But the forest became the morass of the very convention she was trapped in. Um, in that sense, in that short, short story, I felt the depth of her pain, but I also experienced what is it like for her to recover and protect her own dignity. And at the same time, being pulled apart by her devotion to her family name as well, and that struggle she has not to dishonor her family. The second story, happened to me marking a GP essay, I was posted to a JC, and there was a student who was really shy in my class, and her essays were not very strong, but we supported her nonetheless. But she was, she was very quiet, she had friends and all that, so one occasion, one midterm exam, etc., it happened seven years ago, I noticed that her essays had little 
the intentions, there were intentions that were smudged. Okay, and certain words had smudging, and it was a bit unusual. And it happened from two papers, one was towards the end, the other one was scattered all over. So I thought, well, this is a bit unusual, and my first thing that came to mind was, okay, do you write this essay in a park and it was about to rain, you know, do you put it in the shelter? I said, I, I know there's something going on, but why are there patches here that is there's something leaking your aircon or something? Uh, she was really quiet for a while, and it took me about a month or so to get her to trust and to open up. And I, she told me that her mother was actually suffering from mental illness. And that very night when she was writing the essay, her mother was just smashing plates non-stop on the ground because she was descending into a, a, a severe stage of bipolar disorder. She, the mother was smashing plates non-stop on the ground and holding onto the window and screaming on the top of her voice and threatening to jump. Uh, but the grills were locked, but to protect her own mother, she had to stay in the kitchen and continue writing her essay because the mother wouldn't want her to come. Can you imagine a child, uh, someone of your age, going through that? Um, I felt the depth of her confusion, the dignity of her intending to finish the assignment. If anything at all, she had all the excuse not to submit the assignment on time. And I always tell this story to my students, and they realize that that's why I'm a stickler for handing out work on time. Because this is what my students taught me. Um, the dignity of finishing the work on time, and the devotion to a mother, simply by keeping vigil. The last story was one belonging to one of my colleagues who left PG to look after Sebastian. I have permission to use that picture. Sebastian is coming to 11 years old. He's born with cerebral palsy. The mother didn't expect him to have neurological disorders. And when he was born, a few weeks later, I realized that half the brain wasn't formed well. And she said that sometimes for a mother who is expecting a child, it's like boarding a plane expecting to go to destination X. But the plane landed in that destination Y instead. And you're stuck on an island, you can never fly home. Uh, today, I still visit Sebastian and her family. Uh, and we grew close over time with the family, etc. And Sebastian can't speak. Uh, he has to depend on his mom 24 7, and the mom teaches as well, and she has to leave her job to look after him. Uh, they, are, they have been gifted and graced with a very helpful helper who happens to be from Myanmar. And every time I go there, I, I, I'm a witness of human beauty and fragility happening at the same time. Sebastian, because of his neurological condition, develops slam very quickly, and if they are not uh, taken out or um, with the help of the tubing, he can potentially choke himself to death. So the entire day is um, devoted to him, and it involves waking up, uh, putting, cleaning his stoma, feeding him liquid diet, and patting him on his exercise ball, because he's, like I said, his lens develops quickly as well. And um, his mama has told me that um, in, in the early part of Sebastian's birth, she, when she goes to the park and all, and she sees children playing around, their mother and all that, and screaming out, mommy, and all that, she would just turn to one corner and sometimes she, she would tear because Sebastian will never be able to call her mommy because he doesn't have that capacity for speech. But each time I visit the house, I experience occasionally the, the depth of her loss, uh, not in terms of the ideals, because every mom and every parent wants to have a normal child. At the very same time, being a quiet witness of the care that they devote to him, I'm also reminded how she, remind, she reminds me of the dignity of every person as well. This person happens to be disabled. So what if they can't talk? So what if he can't move his eyelid too often? And over time, the beauty of it is that she grew to read his every language, every body movement and the language, a mouth murmur, a soft whimper, a little tweak in his eye, everything was just pure language uh, for her. And that is what dignity was about for my friend, and that is what she taught me. And devotion to a child, and as 
I stand here today, I, I hope I'm also expressing what Sebastian could never tell her, his mother, what it means to, to love a person without condition, what it means to love another child unconditionally. And every time I visit the home, I walk out always feeling very humble. My world grows a little bigger, grows a little deeper, because I have been a very privileged uh, witness of what it means for another human being to love another so completely. I started this sharing by letting you know that human persons like you and me are mysteries, and that all of us have this are gems, there are these three gems in us that are waiting to be discovered. Depth, dignity, and devotion. Um, not easy to find them all the time, but then again, these three stories remind me that the human spirit is not limited by age, nor is it limited by circumstances, or circumstance for that matter. And as a teacher, I, I stand here today very privileged and forever humbled by these stories that uh, I've been privileged to encounter in life. And I hope that um, as you leave the confines of this room, once the talk is over, whatever stories that we offer you, you will also be you also realize that this school that you are in, or whatever wherever place that you go in life, everybody has a story. Everybody is fighting a battle that they are fighting, and we may not be privileged to know. But should you be privileged enough to cross their path, and be privileged enough to receive their stories? I hope um, you will um, open up your heart and allow yourself to, to learn more about life through them. Because at the end of the day, our quest and our deeper search for depth, for dignity, and for devotion will make us better persons in the life to come. Yeah, thank you.